So why don't you go ahead and start telling me, first of all, where you work and what the last couple of days has looked like for you. Okay. Um, so my name is Nathan Aarons, and I'm a vascular surgeon in um, Portland, Maine. I'm at Maine Medical Center. Um, mm -hmm. It's the lar largest hospital in the Northeast outside of Boston, pretty much. So um, almost two weeks ago, we stopped doing uh, purely elective operations across the board um, and for multiple reasons, uh, but mostly just to uh, preserve and ration some of the supplies that we have anticipated that we're going to need moving forward a lot of the kind of protective gear and equipment mm -hmm. that a lot of the other hospitals in some of these hot zones have noted that they've been rationing or without. Um, so uh, for me in my specialty, about 40% of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is urgent or emergent. So still um, I'm operating a fair bit and still seeing patients in the clinic, um, but really only if people have acute limb or life-threatening problems. Um, and so it's really been scaled back a lot here. You know, there's a lot of kind of questions and confusion about uh, things you know, that are appropriate, like job security and pay and salary and uh, livelihood, mm -hmm. um, not just among the doctors, but also among many of the support staff and other medical professionals. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a weird time. We have not yet been um, hit with kind of that upswing. Um, uh, you know, we haven't seen the exponential growth curve here like they've seen in New Orleans or, um, or New York City or even Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still on kind of that flat portion of the curve where we do see um, an increase in numbers of those both testing positive as well as those who are sick with the virus. Um, but we are kind of in this weird state where we're kind of like waiting for the storm to hit but we don't know a like when it will hit and we don't know b how bad it will be so it's kind of you know are we preparing for something that that is going to you know preparing for something that we can't even prepare for mm -hmm. or are we preparing for something that will never you know materialize here mm -hmm. are you preparing as if it's going to be as bad as other places um i guess you know it's both good and bad it's it's good in that we can speak with some of our are in some of the hot zones mm -hmm. nationally and internationally and see where they've succeeded and where they've felt fallen short um, and we can kind of prepare for the challenges that some other facilities have had um, the downside is that you know it's kind of like you hear the if you're at war and you hear the screams and the gunshot wounds and you don't know how far away it is in the distance and you don't know who's actually being wounded or injured um, you get reports that there are medical staff and medical professionals who have been um, stricken ill quite severely, some of them from, um, you know, occupational exposure mm -hmm. uh, or patient to physician or patient to nurse, for example, transmission. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to prepare for all sorts of different um, outcomes and, and variables in this situation. Mm -hmm. Are you, is that something that worries you? Um, it worries me. It, it is something that worries me. Obviously, I'm not, you know, I'm 40 years old and I'm healthy. So my overall mortality or the risk that I die if I contract this virus is well under 1%. Um, what worries me more are the stories that I've heard coming out of people who have been taking care of people who are quite ill and then have contracted the virus and have actually got a more severe form of the illness. Mm -hmm. um, they think that these folks who are quite ill have a higher viral load. Mm -hmm. And when they, you know, when they cough or in their sputum, they're shedding more virus. Mm -hmm. And if so, if you come into contact with a higher load of the virus, mm -hmm. theoretically, I guess you can get more sick. It's, it's kind of like if you look at you know, radioactive, uh, radioactivity and you're like responding to Chernobyl, Mm -hmm. How you know if you're closer to the nuclear reactor, then you get quite ill, mm -hmm. um, and that's the way it's kind of coming out anecdotally. Although I haven't seen true kind of scientific publication that that's true. Okay, and can you explain a little bit about the transmission for um, people, just the general public, not even doctors, but because I think people are kind of confused: is it droplet, and what does droplet even mean, or is it you know you're touching a surface? Like what exactly? Um, can you explain about how people need to be safe and do masks actually work? 
because we're hearing mixed things about that. Do like do people need to be gloving up as they're leaving the house? Like what actually makes sense? Right. I think that there is a lot of uh, misinformation and uh, and some of it is quite scary that's out there. Uh, the worry is the biggest worry is that this is transmitted in an airborne fashion. And airborne basically means that the particles can travel in the air for an unknown distance. And just by breathing in air where the particles are, you know, in the vicinity, you can get sick. And so for folks who or diseases that are airborne, then, you know, the recommendation is that people use these N95 um, relatively impermeable filtered masks or respirators so that when you breathe, you're breathing entirely filtered air. Um, and I know that a lot of people in the community and people who are concerned are, you know, snatching these up online and buying them, you know, for ridiculous prices just so that they can protect themselves. And I do understand that because there's enough information that's come out that suggests that there may be an airborne component of this. But from what I know and have read, that's not true. I think that, you know, less kind of uh, one step down from airborne is droplet precautions. And droplet precautions is basically, you know, a mucus fluid from one person gets released into the air and really can only travel, we'll say two meters or six feet. And so that's why we talk about six foot away distance. And so if someone coughs in your vicinity and you're a foot away and you breathe in that air, that can transmit the virus through droplet precautions. Obviously, you know, sharing any sort of uh, saliva or body fluids, et cetera, that can also share that. Um, but droplet precautions, I think, is what most people think that it, how this is transmitted. Routine kind of, you know, keeping your distance, you know, two meters or six feet away. Um, people who wear just a, even just a cloth mask uh, that can protect from some of these droplets uh, is also wise. And obviously avoiding kind of the contact with some of your exposed mucus surfaces, either eyes, nose, mouth, um, that, that does tend to help. And then the third way is contact. So contact precautions, people talk about, oh, how long does this live on any given surface? Mm -hmm. And there was a, um, uh, I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at the viral load on a surface. And they looked at surfaces like copper, or cardboard, et cetera, and to determine how long some of these viruses can live on the surface. And I think that what we're people are recommending is not necessarily, do you need to wear gloves all the time? Um, you probably don't, but if you're worried, sure, go ahead. But gloves do nothing if you still wear gloves and then touch your gloves to your face or your eyes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, good hand hygiene and avoidance of face touching, cleaning surfaces that you come into contact with, mm -hmm. um, I think those are all very, very useful things to do. So we were talking about how it's kind of creating almost a a phobia of even other people just on like a societal level you know like you walk down the street depending where you are and even just coming within like 10 feet of someone seeing someone you just like kind of freeze a little bit do you feel like something like this especially when it's all over in the i mean who knows when it's going to be over but do you think it's going to impact the way we interact as people I think it certainly can. And, and the longer that this goes on, I think that more that it will impact people. Um, I, you know, when I get into an elevator, for example, people give me this look if I'm standing too close, which uh -huh. never would have happened. You know, I was in a grocery store line and the normal thing is you just stand there behind someone else and the woman turned around and she said, can you back up six feet? And part of me was offended because I was like, you know, I look clean and I don't have the virus, but at the same point, she's right during this time, we need to really focus on this. And I was, you know, being incorrect, but I think that, you know, it's true that it could really affect people's ability to kind of, you know, get out and about and get close with other members of society. Mm -hmm. And where you are right now, what are the restrictions? Cause we're in full lockdown and I know every state is very different. Um, what are you guys at at this point? Yeah, so Maine is a is geographically a fairly large state, as you know. It's about the size of New York State, uh, but our population is much less. So we have about 1.2 million people. Um, I'm in Portland, which is the largest city, and it's really only 70,000 people with uh, about a quarter million in the surrounding area total. So it's still not very densely populated, but within Portland, 
Um, all of the non-essential businesses have been shut down, um, but otherwise it's not as uh, kind of draconian as we've seen in some other s countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I think that um, it's a very different feeling right now when you drive down the street and there are really not many or any cars and no businesses are open. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it needs to be even more restricted than what it's at now? Are people abusing that like there have been in other places? For the most part, uh, the Portland and the Maine population as a whole has been really good at social distancing. Mm -hmm. And I think by the nature of many people who live here in the state, a lot of people live here either because they like that quiet pace of life mm -hmm. or they don't really want to be close to their neighbors or mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, I think who's going to be hardest hit by this are a lot of the restaurants, mm -hmm. some of the small businesses. Uh, and I really, you know, feel for them or people living kind of paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. uh, because this is really going to be a, a hard financial hit for, for many, many, many Americans. Mm -hmm. And is it affecting you as, does it change anything you do when you go home? Like, are you seeing family? Um, are you staying away from people? My, um, my parents live about a 10 minute drive from where I am right now. And they're both in their late sixties, early seventies. And so I've seen them once since this all began. Um, and when I went to see them, I didn't go in the house. We went for a walk in their neighborhood and kept distance, et cetera. Um, but I would, not at this point, um, you know, number one, I'm, uh, I've got occupational exposure presumed. Um, and so I wouldn't want to transmit to them and get them sick. Uh, so I'm just keeping my distance, which is, you know, quite frustrating because normally we're a very close family and I would go over there for dinners. Yeah, you know, I go for Shabbat dinner and everything else. And we can't do that because I don't want to get them sick. And I've got a brother in Boston who's got young kids and you know, I FaceTime with them, but otherwise can't go see them. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel it's going to affect people's mental health if this is something that's longer than a couple of weeks? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, one of the reasons why um, the folks in China did the lockdown and shutdown so well is that it's a communist nation. They're used to being told what to do by the government. They're used to being told what to eat, et cetera, where to live, how to live by the government. And that's just not the American way of life. And so it is very difficult, I think, to take that American mentality of, hey, we're free and nobody will tell us what to do, and then have the government step in and start saying, you need to stay home, you need to not go out, uh, you need to not go to the bars and the restaurants and the stores and not hang out with your friends. And so many people have um, resorted to you know, getting around this, either, um, you know, reading books and watching Netflix and movies and doing online yoga classes and having Zoom meetings to try to stay socially connected. Uh, but at the same time, it is a very kind of, um, you know, it's a lonely time with a lot of isolation, which some people probably really love. Um, and some people really aren't tolerating. So I know that, you know, among you know, for myself, I've been going to work every day, so I haven't really had the same lock in the house loneliness as some of my friends who I've spoken to. Um, but at the same time, some of my partners who are at home this week, because we're switching kind of this week on week off, um, my partners who are home are really like, not doing so well mentally, because it's a lot of I don't know what's coming. I don't know what next week is going to bring. And I don't know what's going on on kind of the healthcare front. So I think there are a lot of concerns that people have that in stressors that are unnatural uh, that people are having to deal with on top of this kind of feeling of isolation. How different are things going to feel or be with hygienic practices on on every level, you know, like, do you, do you think it's going to be a completely different thing? Like how 9-11 changed security like crazy. Do you think it's going to kind of have the same effect with how we deal with hygiene? I think, um, number one, depending on how this, how long this goes on and how ingrained this becomes in our way of life will dictate how people respond to this. I think that people probably will become a bit more hygienic and that's probably good uh, every year when it's influenza season you know we push people to get the immunization 
Um, we also tell people, wash your hands, don't touch your face, like all these same things. And a lot of people say, oh, well, it's the common cold or it's the flu or I, got the, I get the cold every year. And they kind of brush it off because, number one, I don't think any, anyone who's young thinks, oh, I'm going to die from the flu. And number two, they don't see this as being really a pandemic. Um, but the possibility for this to change the way of life, I think, is quite huge. Um, I don't think people will necessarily continue to, you know, bleach every article of mail or package that comes to their home, but I think this will raise awareness of kind of the transmissibility of some, you know, viruses and illnesses. Mm -hmm. Is there any message that you want to share with people who may either not really understand what's going on or not taking it very seriously? Do you have anything that you want to spread the word on? Uh, yes, I would say trust science. Don't trust necessarily politicians and government and economists and business people, but trust science. I mean, this is absolutely fascinating on an epidemiolo epidemiology stand, uh, study uh, because epidemiologists create all these mathematical models to model how this disease will progress and how a pandemic will occur. And the models are matching up exactly with the growth curve and the spread of these viruses. And if you look at the exponential growth in cities like New York and New Orleans and, and Detroit, it's fascinating. It's, it's saddening. It's incredibly sad, but it's fascinating. But, you know, sometimes, you know, science just needs to be trusted. And it, it frustrates me when I see, you know, people online, especially some of our big name politicians, who refute science and say, oh, well, you know, uh, this will be fine and everybody will be fine. And I understand not wanting to create a panic among the, you know, the population, but, and there are probably things that the general population can't understand and process and tolerate. Um, but at the same time, I think that the realism of the science needs to be stressed. And what we're seeing right now is the you know, is science in play. We're seeing these hospitals being overrun by these patients and people dying. And people, maybe we don't know dying, but now every day when you look at the news, you see someone who was famous for one thing or another who has died. And it's almost like that part of the Oscars every year where they show the role of like who died last year. Mm -hmm. But now it's like every day. Yeah. And, and it's really sad. But I think that the message that I would say is, you know, trust science, trust the scientists, trust the information that we're getting from, from the folks who really are on the front lines with respect to medicine and the study of viruses and epidemiology and listen to them. And the faster, you know, or the, you know, the quicker we adhere to these guidelines, the faster this will either be over or the better we'll be able to react to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's really My pleasure, good. absolutely.